Thank you so much for agreeing to do this, Secretary Hobbs. It's a pleasure to have you up here. And we have some questions, again, that all came from our members. So I appreciate you taking time to answer these questions that hopefully we can get to the bottom of what the state might look like if you were governor. So let's start right away. If you win in November, you won't have much time to prepare for session. You have to deliver an inaugural address, you have to come up with a budget, and you have to address the joint you know, legislative se session. Have you given any thought to what your first year might look like? Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much, Danny, and to the chamber for doing this event. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. So I have the advantage of having served in the legislature and at an executive level in statewide office. Uh, so I understand how government works, and I'm ready to provide a steady hand of leadership that's going to continue to steer our state in the right direction. I've spent the last year plus on the campaign trail talking to voters across the state about the issues they're concerned about. I'm hearing from them about affordability, about our state's water crisis, about fixing our education system. And we have plans for all of those things, and those plans are going to help us get to work on day one uh, to, uh, to address some of these challenging issues we're facing. I think we're going to get to some of those plans a little bit later, so that's, that's good. Uh, look forward to hearing on that. Now, your background, which Rebecca Butler just went in great detail on, is not one of private business. How can voters, particularly in this room, be assured that your administration would be good for business? Uh, that's a great question, and I am absolutely committed to making sure that we're continuing to do the things that are working well to continue to bring great jobs to the state of Arizona and make sure that Arizona is a great place to do business. We've done tremendous work uh, over the past several years to rehabilitate the state's reputation nationally and make it an attractive place to come. We need to continue doing those things that are working. Uh, I will say, as a social worker, I saw firsthand some of the most vulnerable Arizonans. I know how impactful having a good paying job can be to improve the quality of life. So it's absolutely something I'm, I'm going to be committed to continuing doing. Thank you. You mentioned the state's reputation a second ago, which is a good transition to our next question. I, I just returned from a trip to Taiwan and South Korea on an economic development mission, and how the governor plays into that is important. I want to ask about your approach to economic development. Do you see yourself as a governor who will be out there personally wooing companies? I think absolutely. Who better than the governor to make the case for why Arizona is a great place to do business and to, to sell our brand? Uh, and you know, I think it's important to have someone who is serious about governing and not someone who's going to continue to end up as the butt of late night comedy television jokes. That's not going to be effective. OK. Well, this next question is starting to get a little bit hotter. A favorable tax Low regulation and right-to-work environment have been essential for attracting new industries. I think most people in this room would agree. As well as encouraging the creation of small businesses across the state. You expressed disappointment that Proposition 208, which it's no secret the chamber fought very hard against, would have resulted in a top income tax rate of 8%. It was ruled to be unconstitutional. Should we anticipate that you'll advocate for higher taxes? Absolutely not. I am pro-growth. And I want to be clear that my disappointment at that ruling was more about the years of effort that our teachers and parents put into uh, trying to increase funding for education. Uh, and many times they're shut out of the conversation in those discussions. And so that really was where my disappointment was coming from. Uh, you know, we all know in this room it takes a two-thirds majority to raise taxes. I am not even considering that at this point. So, um, and, and our climate, our environment is good. It's working. It's bringing in record revenues that are allowing us to make historic investments in things like uh, water security for our state. Uh, so I don't think we need to do anything to change that. I like the answer. I feel like it's a little bit on the slogan of couldn't raise taxes even if I wanted to. So. It's not on the table. <laughs> Great. So um, there has been a big shift in public sentiment when it comes to how they view how business engages in the public square. And this is probably one of the top questions we got submitted to us. So in your opinion, what is the proper role of government when it comes to business? Should the government have authority to regulate the workplace, the, the workplace private policies of their employers? And if so, to what extent should government be able to intervene? 
I think there always needs to be an open dialogue, an open door uh, to, to talk about where that balance needs to be and ensuring that workers are safe, that businesses are staying open, and that our economy is strong. Uh, and I don't think anyone should be inserting regulations without understanding what's happening on the ground and talking to people in those industries. Uh, and, you know, regardless of if there are things going on in that environment that we disagree, I'm always going to have an open door to have those conversations. Thank you. In that same vein, and we're seeing this around the country right now, that a lot of corporations whether large or small, have decided to pull back their engagement. And a lot of it's out of fear of retaliation. So should businesses and corporations have the right to free speech, including political speech, without that fear of retaliation from government leaders? Absolutely. Everyone has the right to engage in political discourse and not have retaliation from elected officials or their government. Uh, I think the, the free market is sufficient to, to take care of that if they think a corporation has gone a direction that they don't like. Okay. We're moving on to education. You are a product of Seton Catholic, a private school. Is it advisable for government to find a way to allow more kids, including those whose families might not be able to afford it, to attend private schools like Seton? Well, I think that my legislative record speaks for itself uh, in terms of where I stand on public dollars funding private education. Um, every chance I had an opportunity to vote on expanding uh, vouchers, I voted no. And I will say that my parents uh, made the choice to send me to Catholic high school. They struggled. They made huge sacrifices to do that. Um, and they didn't use tax dollars to do that. Uh, I actually didn't want to go to Catholic school. <laughs> uh, but that's a whole other story for a different day. But, um, but n no, I, I think that if we really want to give all of our kids uh, the best quality education, we have to invest in our public schools so that no matter what zip code, what neighborhood kids live in, they have the equal opportunity because the current scheme of vouchers does not provide equal access. And there are still thousands of kids who are going to be shut out of that opportunity. And the best way to provide that opportunity is to fund our public schools. Uh, now, I'm going to take this opportunity to say there are things that we're not going to agree on, but my door is always going to be open. Uh, and so that's what I just want to say about that. Well, yes, please. Thank you for that answer. Uh, a couple of things. First, I, too, had a year or two at Catholic school that I wish I could have back. I wasn't asked uh, my opinion on the matter. And I have some nightmares about my hands being hit with rulers. Um, corporal punishment was a thing. Second, uh, I'll get in trouble if I don't say this. In Arizona, we call them ESAs, you know, Power Rent Scholarship Accounts, not vouchers. So before I get yelled at for that later, I just I have to throw that out. I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate you. So, we are all kumbaya up uh, here. Well. Now the issue that you mentioned earlier, and it's kind of been on everyone's mind, and this last two weeks especially, I'm talking about water, and you can kind of group energy into that as well. The governor last session signed a $1 billion water protection bill. What does a secure water future for Arizona look like to you? Well, I think, first of all, we have to take decisive action, and the longer it takes to take that action, the more expensive it's going to be. So a billion dollars is a great start, but it is not enough to do what we need to do. Um, and we also, I think that the governor's plan is a great start, and it relies heavily on desalination, which is not an immediate solution. Uh, so, so it's going to take a long time to even get there to where we're starting to produce water from desalination. Uh, I'm grateful for the additional billions of dollars that are coming to Arizona from the hard work of our senators through the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, which I know also this crowd didn't support, but that is a good piece of it. So, uh, because it's going to help us, because we're in a crisis right now. Um, and so our campaign put out a sustainable Arizona plan. We address water issues. We address uh, climate and how that impacts uh, our increased drought and continued water shortages and has some ideas of what we can do now, what we need to plan for in the future. Uh, but what's clear is that we need partnership. 
Uh, we need partnership with the other basin states so that they're pulling their weight and doing more to conserve the Colorado River. Uh, we need partnership with tribes and with other water stakeholders to bring all the solutions to the table. Thank you. So first of all, I should point out there are people, members in the audience who did support the, I, the very poorly named IRA, uh, even though we might have had a very big public campaign against it. So for what it's worth, I would, again, have to represent my members fairly, in particular, the energy portions of that bill. And a lot of it is because of what you're seeing in California right now with the disaster um, with energy management. Speaking of potential disagreements, though, <laughs> what should a governor do when a city adopts a policy that the governor disagrees with? Well, again, I think my legislative record on this is pretty clear, and I've most often sided with local control. I have all the leak plaques on my wall to, share, to show that. Um, but here's the thing. My door is always going to be open, and we are all in this together in making Arizona the best place to live, work, and raise a family, whether it's the business community, our cities and towns, <laughs> So even when we disagree, we have to work in partnership. And I'll give a really good example of um, walking into a situation where there was a complete lack of working together. When I got to the Secretary of State's office, we had to do a lot of work to rebuild relationships with county election officials. Uh, and they didn't trust our office. But we knew to execute successful elections in 2020, which this was before we knew all the challenges we are gonna face in 2020, uh, that we needed those partnerships. And so we did not always agree. There were often times where we fought uh, with all the counties, with some of the counties, but we kept that door open, we kept that dialogue going, and that partnership was so critical, and we got it done in 2020. No voter in the state had to choose between their freedom to vote and their health and safety, and we saw historic participation. It was because of the, that investment in that partnership, and that is how I will govern. Uh, regardless of if I agree or disagree with whoever I'm working with. Thank you. If I were to poll our audience uh, of business leaders and job creators and ask what their biggest issue is, a lot of them would say a labor shortage, that they just don't have enough workers. So I'm curious what you see as a solution. In, is it CTE? Are you supportive of CTE? Are you supportive of a dual track? You know, do you have ideas and a plan around this? I don't talk to a single employer who doesn't have workforce at the top of their list of issues. And I've had people tell me, you know, a year ago, or maybe two years ago, it might have been in the top three, and now it is the top three. And so clearly, we're having issues there. So yes, CTE is absolutely a solution for that. But we can't start there. And I'm going to go back to investing in public education, starting with access to early childhood education and pre-K that gets our kids off to the right start so that they aren't falling behind and so that they're getting to graduation so that CTE is even an option for them. Uh, we need to work to make sure we're having our school systems and job creators collaborating so that we're training kids for the right careers and that we're building that pipeline for the jobs that we're creating. Thank you. You know, the next question kind of alludes to the fact that Arizona has a famously late primary. And, you know, you had several primary opponents. But what are you saying now to, to voters to, who might have voted for your opponents in that primary to try and win them over and earn their vote in the general? All these polls seem to show there's very few undecideds. So what is the message that you think is important for them to hear? So, first of all, I'm proud of the fact that I earned over 70% of the, of the vote in the Democratic primary. Uh, but we're building the same kind of coalitions that we did in 2018 that led to my victory uh, in that election. Uh, and I've been talking to voters across the state. I don't care if they're Democrats, Republicans, or independents. The issues I mentioned, I'm hearing from across the board. Uh, and these are, they're not Democrat or Republican issues, they're Arizona issues, and they need Arizona solutions. And so we're talking about how we come together and, and bring those solutions to the table. Uh, we just last week announced a coalition of Republicans that is growing, that is supporting my campaign, and tomorrow you'll be seeing a list of Latinos that's supporting the campaign. So we're going to continue to build those uh, supporters as well. At the end of the day, this election is not about Democrats or Republicans. It is about sanity versus chaos. 
Well, thank you so much, Secretary Hobbs. You know, we, we've reached the end of our allotted 20 minutes, but I do, as always, want to give you the last portion uh, to be able to, to close out. But I would ask you to think about one thing that most of the people in the room have had experience at the governor, you know, in the government, and they, they've spent some time with you and they know your record. So what would you say to everyone here in closing? And uh, you may, maybe address your record where we didn't always agree. Well, I think that I, 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 I've always approached my office, whether it's in the legislature or a secretary of state, as someone who's been given this job to, to govern or help govern. And I take that responsibility incredibly seriously. Governing is not sitting on the ninth floor and telling people what to do. It is working in partnership to make our state the best place it can possibly be for everyone, where every Arizona can thrive, where we have opportunity for all. And that is what I'm gonna be focused on as governor. I don't think that is a Democratic agenda or Republican agenda, it is an Arizona agenda, and we can work together to do that. Thank you so much, Secretary Hobbs. Good luck. Next up is Carrie Lake, Republican candidate for governor of Arizona. Lake. <laughs> Carrie Lake is a former television news anchor with a prominent career in journalism spanning nearly 30 years. Growing up in Iowa, Lake earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in communications and journalism from the University of Iowa. In 1994, Lake was hired by KPNX in Phoenix, where she started as a weekend weather anchor and later worked in evening news. In 1999, Lake was hired as a news anchor by Fox 10, where she remained until announcing her run for governor last year. Carrie, thank you for being here tonight. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Arizona's Republican candidate for governor, Carrie Lake. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for the introduction, and thank you so much, Ms. Lake, for coming and doing this with it's us today. It's good to be here. Thank you, Danny. Hello, everyone. It's a good crowd tonight. My goodness. It, it is. A and quiet crowd. It's okay. You can make a sound out there. Thank you, Danny. No, Thanks I, I like the enthusiasm. I, I want you to know I have cards to drop if the clapping goes on too long, but I encourage you to do it. Um, well, so. thank, I want to thank everyone for being here. It's, it's a really important to, uh, we've, got a, we've got an important race coming up, and we've got to hear from the candidates, and I wish we were here with all of us on stage. I'm, I think you all know that. I've been wanting to have a debate, and, and I just announced today, I just put a letter out to the clean elections folks saying that I will not agree to a forum that uh, my opponent wants. We're doing that tonight. We need to be on stage together. We need to talk about our, <laughs> our policies. Um, so we've got a couple empty chairs up here, and every time you look at a chair, just think we should be filling that with our opponent here on the stage, but I digress. Thank no, you, no. Danny, for having me. <laughs> no. Please. I, I know one thing. I'm not equipped to handle such a debate. Uh, my, <laughs> my nature is too nice, so um, yes. Thank, whoever, if that does come to fruition, I hope you find a tough, tougher person than I. Um, I've asked this question of you before. You came and met with my board, but I, I want to ask it a little bit different. If you win in November, you won't have much time to prepare for a session. You have to get your budget ready, address the legislature, and I would love for you to talk about what you'll do as governor. You have all these plans on your website, but it seems like every time we hear from you, we're not hearing about these plans and these policies. So I would love to hear a little bit about that. We have great policies, and I, I sure wish the media would cover that. We've offered interviews if they want to talk about our policies, but
but they want to do kind of the bogus stories that get people riled up. So uh, thank you for asking. Um, there's not going to be a lot of time. I mean, that's one of the, the beauties of working in news for so long. There's never enough time. You're running out the door covering the big story, and, and I've lived my life doing that with, you know, you're kind of always running and, and yeah. in a hurry. But um, we're ready to go. I'm ready to go on day one. I'm ready to go right now, frankly. We have a great team surrounding us. You know, they said, they said of Ronald Reagan that he was just an actor who read scripts. What does he know? And he went on to be the greatest governor California ever had. He surrounded himself with great people, the best in the business around him. He brought people in from outside the government. We need to bring people in to help run our government who are outside the bureaucracy because we have a lot of challenges right now. My main issue, and I think if you've covered this, uh, if you've followed this race even for one minute, you know that my main issue has been to secure that border. And on day one, in the first hour, after I take my hand off the Bible with oath of office, we're gonna issue a declaration of invasion and we're gonna start securing the border, take back control from the cartels, and stop the fentanyl from pouring across. I know there, there must be some moms and dads in this, um, in this audience, and maybe even if you're not a mother or father, you have to be disturbed by this fentanyl crisis. I'm not comfortable, and I'm not willing to accept the fact that Arizona is the pipeline for fentanyl pouring across this border. We can't have that. Talk about being the butt of jokes. If we continue having an open border, it's gonna be worse than being the butt of jokes. We will have the worst reputation in the country, will be known as the state that the cartels control. And I'm taking that control away from the cartels starting on day one. My opponent doesn't have a plan. She doesn't have a plan. Her plan is to let Joe Biden handle it. And Joe Biden's the reason we're in this hole that we're in. Additionally, besides the border, we're gonna work on that. We're also gonna work on a dual track education for our kids, making sure our kids are properly educated. You know, we, we, they spend 13 years in school, K through 12. And they certainly should be getting out. If they're not heading on a career path where they're going to go to a four-year college, they should be prepared for the working world. We want a dual-track education after 10th grade. Our kids will decide if they want to take that path to go into college or if they want to go to a, and get a trade, ed, a trade skills, they want to get a vocational education, or they want to get career certification. There's not a darn reason we can't do that while our kids are in high school so they can take those jobs right out of high school. I want to tackle the homeless crisis. I want to end urban camping, as it's called, in a compassionate way, get people help, turn them into productive citizens, and at the same time, restore quality of life for the hardworking, tax-paying citizens. You all run businesses, I'm assuming. It's gonna get really hard to run a business if we turn into San Francisco, Seattle, LA, or Portland. No one wants to run a business when they can't safely operate that business. So we have to tackle this. We will do it. I wanna do the big things. And we, of course, need to tackle our water issues. I, I spent yesterday down with the folks in Yuma, the ag community. We've got half of Pinal County where they can't even grow crops right now because of the water situation, and it's only gonna get worse. I moved into town August of 94, I drove in, it was 113 degrees, got out of my car and said, oh my gosh, I love this place. I knew right then and there, Arizona, I was made for Arizona. But we have been talking about water since August of, when I got in town, even before that. And we haven't done anything. We gotta stop with the meetings and get some action. Arizona has been a very integral part of securing and trying to secure our Colorado River resources. But we can't do it alone. We've got to look at uh, bringing in new water sources, and there's no such thing as a pie-in-the-sky idea. Maybe we bring desal in from Mexico. Maybe we do desalination for the brackish water that sits um, in our groundwater. We can desal that and clean it up and use that, but I believe we need to look at water resources coming in from the Missouri River Basin, the Mississippi River Basin. I want, by the end of my eight years, to have water flowing into Lake Mead and for once and for all take care of our water shortage here in Arizona. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like you just answered the next 12 questions with that, <laughs> with that very ambitious agenda so everyone can go home. No, I, I'm, I'm kidding. I do have to say part of my I job... I a few things out. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, we'll get to them. Part of my job is to say great things about Arizona so whenever it gets really hot I like to say it's like a warm hug waiting for you outside. 
but I'm lying. When it's 113 degrees outside, it's terrible. So uh, good, good for you for being able to take it and it's, loving our state. I used state to say our heat is the only thing from keeping us from becoming California, but California <laughs> has jumped the shark. They have uh, literally destroyed that state in many ways with their policies that we're becoming California with the population growth. Now the key is we don't want to become California with those policies, those dead end policies. The latest one is almost like a, a late night joke. You have to have an electric car, but now we don't have the electricity, so you can't charge your car. I mean, this is the kind of policies that I fear we will get if we do not elect the right person this time around. It's that dire what we're looking at. Thank you. Well, on that ambitious agenda, there's some who say because you've never worked in government, how can voters be sure you're ready for this job? You know how to pass such a huge and very necessary and important agenda. So I don't have the experience you're saying that others have had, the political experience. You know, I, I think the people are ready for some outsiders. Reagan didn't have that political experience, government experience. President Trump didn't either. We had great policies from these people. It's the people that have that experience, that have the government experience, that have the political experience, that have gotten us into this mess. And we need an outsider to get us out of it. Everything I've done in my life, I've worked hard for. You know, some people like to criticize the fact that I was a journalist. I was a good journalist. I was a fair journalist. I came from a family of nine, the youngest of nine. My father was a school teacher, a public school teacher, and my mother was a nurse. And we had to work for everything we had. I was the youngest, so if I wanted toothpaste, I'm not kidding, I had to buy my own toothpaste. I've worked hard since I was a kid, and I will take that same work ethic into the governor's office. I'm surrounding myself with the best people to solve our problems, to help solve them. The beautiful thing about being a journalist is that not many people have a career where every day they walk into work and they have to wrap their arms around truly the biggest issues facing our state. So for nearly 30 years, I've been covering the issues that face Arizona. And I have a great understanding and, and understanding of the people of Arizona. And that's why we have a movement, because the people of Arizona know who I am. I've been in their homes for 27 years. I've been invited into their homes. And they have a, a trust and a level of trust with me. And I'm friends with them, and they know me. So I think there's a real connection I have with the people of Arizona. We're going to take this movement of people, and with great conservative policies, and the people behind us, there's no stopping what we can do to make sure that we are a state where our businesses thrive, where we have safety and security. We can't have businesses thriving if we don't have safe streets. We can't have businesses thriving if we are run by the cartels and have a fentanyl crisis. And we can't have businesses thriving if our children aren't getting an education to prepare them for the true jobs that are out there. So in other words, I'm ready on day one. I'm ready right now. <laughs> My goal is to not have Dan talk, OK? <laughs> for, yeah, no, it's, I think they appreciate that. That's OK. Um, so you just said that everyone in Arizona knows you because you've been in their living room for 27 years. Let's talk about other places that might not know you and your approach to economic development. Do you believe it is the role of the governor to go out and woo companies? And, and what do you think your approach would be to that? Absolutely. I mean, the governor kind of becomes the face of the state in some ways. And there's nobody who's a bigger cheerleader for Arizona than me. We have the greatest state. I drove in here in 94. Many of us are transplants. Some of us are natives. But um, this has been a state that has offered so much opportunity to people. People can start over in Arizona. People can start a business here and watch it thrive because we have a great economic climate. We've got to continue that. We can't have onerous taxes. We can't have onerous regulations. We can't have uh, truly some of the, I call them terrorists in the environmental movement trying to control our businesses. They're okay dropping businesses here, killing businesses here, and sending them over to China. And they're fine with them polluting over there, but they're absolutely opposed to having a business thrive here. So we gotta have common sense solutions and we can't have the policies we're seeing in California right now. That's what we're gonna get with my opponent. If you look at her record, and it's easy to find, she's never, uh, she's for ta raising taxes. She sat here and said she wasn't. She's for raising taxes, look at her record. She's raised taxes, she voted for raising taxes. Thankfully, we had a majority with Republicans and it didn't go through. She's for sex education starting in kindergarten. These are crazy ideas, folks. The Democrats are not the Democrats that we used to know. They're not the Democrat Party of JFK. 
I mean, we have, think of the stuff we've got going on in this world right now. And the Democrats and my opponent are pushing for, and it's on her website, uh, sex change, gender affirming surgeries. With all the stuff happening in the world, they're focusing on that. This is crazy times. We need to get back focusing on the stuff that matters. Get on the right track and make sure Arizona is the most successful state. People will want to come here. We're going to have a safe state. We won't have to throw a bunch of incentives out because we will be such an awesome state. Everyone's going to want to come here. And that's what I'm counting on. Get us in the right track so people want to come here. And give Arizona companies a little bit of TLC. They've been ignored for the past three years and in some ways tortured by government shutdowns and COVID restrictions. Thank you. I, I can say when we were over in, in Taiwan and South Korea, companies that have chosen to locate here repeatedly said it wasn't incentives because we don't really have discretionary incentives here in Arizona. What made them come here was how welcome they felt. So that's a testament to everyone in this room and to people who are out there speaking on our behalf. That's great. Well, and, and you know, I hope we don't ever get to a place where we have to throw out so many incentives just to get businesses interested in coming here. I hope that they appreciate our people, they appreciate our climate, obviously. They appreciate our business climate. With a governor like me, they will. Governor Ducey's done some great things. There's no reason to change that up. And they appreciate our tax climate, our, our regulations, which are low, and we're gonna get rid of some of the regulations. We want to get out of the way of business. And we wanna have safe streets, a secure border. Then people will flock here, because trust me, they are running from these blue states. They're packing up and leaving. Think how expensive it would be to move your business. Can you imagine having a business in San Francisco right now or Seattle? And you're looking around, even, even Starbucks is leaving Seattle in some areas. If we don't clean things up, we're gonna have a situation where no business wants to come here. And we do have to throw a bunch of incentives or they won't wanna come here. Well, let's get back to taxes. You mentioned that um, what your opponent believes on taxes, but let me ask you a specific one. During the Great Recession, and I'm asking this because we know our economy outlook right now is a little bit uncertain, but during the Great Recession, Governor Brewer supported a temporary sales tax increase. Was that wise? And under what circumstances would you envision supporting a tax increase? We were in a tough situation because of the Democrat governor that came before her who spent like a drunken sailor. And we had to do some uh, difficult work. So I don't want to sit here and criticize Governor Brewer. We were in a, in a difficult situation. I am for lowering taxes every place that we can. That is how you actually see growth, and that's how we have seen growth in the past. You know, when, when we're taking less taxes out of someone's hard-earned paycheck, out of a company, that person will spend that money that we're not taking from them, and we end up getting taxes off of what they're spending. When we're not taxing your business, you're gonna reinvest that and grow your business. Maybe that means you hire more people. You open another location. You grow your business. The worst thing you can do is continue to raise taxes. And all you have to do is look at California, the dire straits they're in, and I just heard they wanna raise taxes again. Illinois, they've raised taxes to the point where it's almost unlivable. On the Magic Mile in uh, Michigan Avenue in Illinois, the shops are pulling up stops. They don't even want to have their shops open there. It's a tax policy and a crime policy that they have in Chicago that's killing that city and, frankly, killing that state. So we will lower taxes. We have a policy. We haven't put it out yet. We're going to lower taxes every year, starting with sales tax. We're going to work on property taxes. I know too many people who are retired who paid off their homes, and they feel like they're renting their home back from the government. It's outrageous. And we're gonna work on bringing the income tax back. I'd like to bring it down to zero, but I don't like to make promises that I can't deliver on. So we're gonna work to bring it down to zero if we can. I wanna be the person that under promises and over delivers. And then we're gonna work on bringing down fees and, and all those little hidden fees that are taxes in my fourth year. And then on the next four years, we'll, we'll get to even bigger things. Good chamber answer. <laughs> I don't honestly, think honestly, that's my answer whether I'm here with the chamber, uh, if I'm in Camp Verde, if I'm down in Yuma talking to the egg people. Taking your hard-earned money is not a good business move, period. Perfect. Well, let's talk about mandates and what is the proper role of government when it comes to business. 
Should the government have the authority to regulate workplace policies of private employers? The government was so out of control during COVID. I hate to even think about it, it makes my blood boil. Closing our businesses down, masking our beautiful children. You don't need to be a scientist to know that putting a mask on your face, forcing a child to breathe in their own waste all day, I mean, I thought I had a hearing problem during COVID because I realized that when I communicate with somebody, I look at their whole face. I, I, I read lips apparently because I couldn't hear anything. Our government shut our churches down, they shut our schools down, and they shut our businesses down. For some of you, that, that it was difficult, but you're big enough that you could survive. But for the small business, it was nearly deadly. So many businesses went under and they'll never come back. It was unbelievable what happened. And I will never, I will sit here and make you a promise, I will never shut your business down. I will never tell you how to operate your business, how to mask your employees, when you can be open for business, what kind of service you can provide your customers. I will never shut churches down. You will never have to write me an email saying, please don't shut my child's school down. And I will never force you to mask your employees or vax your employees against their will. It's outrageous that that happened. Thank you. So just to understand, the, your, your, your position is to government shouldn't have a role in private employers regulating the safety of their... I think we should, we should look at basic workplace safety. This vaccine, I, I'm not trying to get up here and, and debate the vaccine. Some of you may have gotten it, some of you may not have. Nobody should be forced to get an experimental shot and it was experimental. It was experimental. It put a lot of people in a position of great stress to worry about whether they're gonna be able to put food on the table or keep their job. And the government forced that. And I would have fought back against the federal government. I know it wasn't the state government necessarily, it was mainly coming from the CDC. Didn't take a lot to look at Fauci and realize the guy's full of it. And now we know for a fact he was full of it. And so I would push back against that. And I think we had a great case in the, at the Supreme Court last session. I believe it was EPA uh, versus West Virginia and that cracked open the door for us to push back against these unelected bureaucrats who are trying to destroy our businesses and push us around. A lot of these agencies, they're not elected officials. They are, they are lifelong bureaucrats and they're trying to tell us how to run our business and run our life. And that case, I think, was a critical case. I don't think people realize how important that case was. It cracked open the door for us to push back against some of these regulations that are strangling us, strangling our businesses. And I'm happy to kick that door open a little bit more. After that case, set precedence. Thank you. Let's talk about the First Amendment, free speech. You've been very articulate on that subject on the campaign trail, but do businesses and corporations have the right to that same free speech, including political speech, without fear of retribution from the government? Yes, I want to bring back free speech. I want to bring back the Constitution, okay? Are you guys okay with that? The whole thing. Um, I did see a lot of businesses that were, did feel free to express free speech if it was more of one side of ideology, the left and the woke ideology. But a business that wanted to put out pro-America posts or messaging, they were afraid to do so, just as Americans are afraid to do so. And I'm telling Americans right now, don't be afraid, you have to speak out right now. We are in the, I used to say we're in the 11th hour of saving this country and our constitution. I think we're in the final minutes and we gotta start standing up for our right to have free speech. I think businesses should, should have that right and they shouldn't just be able to put the, the BLM stuff out. My opponent was a BLM activist. And, and BLM, remember, was the one burning down our businesses and burning down our streets. But it was only okay for businesses to post pro-BLM stuff that was started by self-admitted Marxists. They're not for America, they're not for capitalism, they're not for what makes America great. So we need to make sure that we truly do have free speech for businesses, for individuals, no matter what their ideology no matter what their ideology, and I will fight for that. I'm not gonna allow people to have their constitutional rights stripped away for uh, political purposes. If you wanna do make a, dona a political donation, you should feel free to do that and not have to worry about losing your business or having your reputation dragged through the mud. Thank you. You support ESAs. 
Should schools that accept ESAs administer an achievement test? I'm so, I am so proud of our legislature. I know there might be a few people in here who are part of the legislature. Thank you, thank you, thank you. From one mama bear, I thank you so much for making that happen. Really, we, that was the first, uh, on my, on my uh, policy for education, that was the first line. We need to fund the student and not the system. And they made that happen. We'd like to expand that even further. And, and I thank Governor Ducey for signing that into law. I had a great opportunity to meet with him not too long ago after the primary. It was a grueling primary. But we sat down and, and we had a nice meeting. And I believe that's his legacy, education freedom and making that happen. And now they're trying to fight that. They're trying to fight that with an, with an initiative, this huge stride we've made in education. I absolutely support it. I think that parents should have the choice to send their kids to whatever school is best fit for their child. And the best way to improve our curriculum is through competition. People in this room know that. If you have a child going to this school and you find out they're teaching a bunch of garbage, doesn't make sense, and you want to pull them out of that school, or you just find a school you like better, you move them to this school. This is basic competition. Pretty soon this school is going to say, why are we losing students? What are we doing wrong? And how can we provide a better product so that these students want to stay? The great thing about uh, private schools and charter schools is that they view the student as a customer. And the private schools view them as a captive. I'm sorry, the public schools view them as a captive. We own them. We've got them. Nothing they can do. We need competition in our schools. This is the best way to improve all schools. And I think we're going to see that very quickly. Thank you. You know, last time I asked this question to your opponent, I, I felt Mary Gallego's gaze, so I'm going to stare that direction this time. What should a governor do when a city adopts a policy that that governor disagrees with? Well, I'm going to be the governor of all Arizonans, and so I want to help protect Arizonans. And if there are some outrageous policies being pushed that are, frankly, against, for example, sanctuary cities and such, We've got to protect the citizens of Arizona. And if we have a socialist governor, or socialist, uh, if we have a socialist mayor, like the one we have down in Tucson, and up in Flagstaff, and in Phoenix, then we've got to help fight back and protect the people of these cities. I live in Phoenix. Some of the stuff that, that goes on down there is outrageous. The policies are pushing on us. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna use my mouth. You know that I, I have a, a loud mouth sometimes to remind the people of this great state when their city elections are, because sometimes they hold them on weird dates where it's not convenient. We gotta make sure we're electing people who have our best interests at heart. And the way these elections have been set up, especially in a city like Phoenix, people don't know when they are, they're at off dates, and, and it makes it very difficult. People are just unaware. And so I'm gonna use my voice to make people aware and let them know what's going on at our cities. I w I want a, a good, solid, conservative state where businesses can thrive, and we can't have cities where they're putting restrictions on businesses and uh, not allowing them to thrive. Thank you. You spoke about water earlier, so let me ask this question a little bit differently. What does a secure energy future look like to you? How does Arizona maintain um, its you know, energy security, reliability, the things we're not seeing in California, which you spoke about briefly earlier. Well, the two things are really important. I think especially for business, water and energy are, are hugely important. And I would, I would go on to say that a, a safe environment, a safe streets are important for business as well, and an educated workforce. We have a real opportunity right now. I know that things seem very much out of control. We're watching California with the brownouts. I just talked to a friend over there who said, I have to turn my air conditioner up. I have to turn, uh, unplug everything that's not essential. I mean, can you believe this is happening over there? They want, us to go, they want them to go electric cars and then you have to unplug everything in the house. I want to work with our power companies, large and small, to make Arizona a powerhouse in power. We need to work to expand nuclear, and we can do that. We can do that with the right people in office who are going to push this. And I'm not talking about, I would love to have five Palo Verde nuclear power plants. That's going to be a little bit difficult, but we have the small modular plants that we can put together, and we can pack them six packs and 12 packs. I'm not talking about beer here. I'm talking about nuclear energy. And put them on all corners of the state. 
And then we can treat our energy as a commodity and sell it to California because with their asinine policies, they're gonna need all the power they can get. And I don't think they're prepared to bring that power to their state. So I want to be a powerhouse when it comes to power here in Arizona. And I'm not opposed to some of the green energy, but I like good old fashioned clean energy, which is nuclear, that's cheap and reliable. And that's what we need here. And I wanna make sure Arizona is on the cutting edge of that. We could sell so much power, we're already selling power to, to California, but we could even um, sell more of it to California. They're gonna need it because they don't know what the hell they're doing over there. Thank you. I've been getting the, the hook for equal time, so if I could, I'm gonna ask you to, to answer this question with a closing statement, and that's the same question that we ended with your opponent, which is, you finished a rough primary. You mentioned it was grueling a little bit earlier. You had uh, quite a few more opponents. And what are you saying now to, to win over the undecided voters or the people who may have voted for your opponents in the primary but aren't necessarily on board with you as we head into the, the final weeks of this campaign? I, I'm not changing my, me I mean, my message is the same. We gotta make sure we have some common sense policies. If you look at my website, carrylake.com, K-A-R-I-L-A-K-E.com, and you look at where I stand on the issues, I don't just put a sentence there, I put the entire policy. We have the best policies for Arizona. We've got a water policy that looks at short-term, medium-term, and long-term water issues and how we solve that problem for once and for all. We have a policy when it comes to the border. It is the strongest border policy this country's ever seen because we have the largest invasion on our home soil since this country was founded. We have the best education policy that will expand education freedom. I'm gonna be the best governor for business because my philosophy is get the, get the government out of your business. The government can't even run the government and we sure as hell can't run your business. And and, and go down and just, I, I encourage you. I encourage you, if you did vote for my opponent, I, I don't hold grudges. I want every vote. And I believe our policies are best for all Arizonans. I have been meeting with people who voted for my opponent. That's how it works. We have primaries. At least the Republicans do. We have primaries. We duke it out. We're tough. And then we come together. I like to say I'm from a big family. And every day I woke up in that family of nine and I said, which one of these people is going to try to eat my food? And which one's going to try to start a fight with me? And, but at the end of the day, we were still family. And we Republicans are family. The, the media wants everyone to think we're warring and, oh, it's this faction versus that. We are very much together because we see what a disaster electing a leftist to office would be for California, or for Arizona. It'll turn us into California. We'll be California 2.0. 2 so we want to prevent that. And we're going to do um, some great things. We need a transformative leader right now, somebody who's not afraid to take big steps, not baby steps, because we've got big problems and big issues. But I will say this as I close, because I know Danny's like, is she going to wrap this up? <laughs> um, I love this state so much. I have two children. And I don't want to have to rent a U-Haul and find another red state with common sense policies. We can solve the problems. There's no problem too big. We used to have big leaders, big thinkers like the Carl Ellers of the world who helped bring us Palo Verde nuclear power plant. The Central Arizona Project was a pie in the sky idea. But the folks who came before us, they accomplished that. The Hoover Dam is a marvel. And the men and women who came before us engineered that and built that. We've got to start thinking big and tackling these big issues before us. The big issues, you know, the last half generation have been how can we get a sports stadium and get the public to pay for it? We've got to think bigger than that. And I plan to be that governor. And I ask you for your vote. I want your business to succeed. And I want to bring other businesses in. I want to bring other people into Arizona. And I want Arizona to be the greatest state in the country. So I thank you for listening tonight. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking both Republican nominee Carrie Lake and Democrat nominee Secretary Katie Hobbs.